going to conclude our series on stewardship. We have talked about what stewardship means. We've talked about the responsibilities that God has given us. We've talked about the grace that He's given you and I to enable us to be good stewards of our finances, of our physical resources, but also those non-tangibles, our gifts, our talents, our abilities, our time, those things that we uh, don't necessarily consider to be things we should be stewards over. We looked at God's grace and how that when you and I are saved, uh, we experience God's saving grace, and then with that comes responsibilities, giving, serving, witnessing, suffering for the cause of Christ, and then God gives us living grace that helps us to uh, endure and accomplish those responsibilities. And as we're obedient to Him and accomplishing those responsibilities, God continues to give us living grace so the cycle forever continues. As long as we're obedient, as long as we strive to serve God, as long as we're giving, as long as we're serving, as long as we're witnessing, as long as we're suffering, God will continue to give us His grace Amen. to ensure that we can do that which He has purposed for our lives. And one thing that you and I must know, that it is 100% possible to be <laughs> joyful givers, Amen. to be joyful servers, to joyfully manage our time. We are to rejoice in God as we are stewards of what He's given us, knowing that nothing I have do I deserve. Amen. See, we live in an age of entitlement where we think we are owed something. God owes us nothing. Amen. What He owes us is death because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Yeah. So what we deserve is death and punishment, but what God gives us through the sacrifice of blood of Jesus Christ is life abundant. We don't deserve it, and we can't earn it. Nope. The resources that he's given us, physical resources, talents, gifts, time, those are all things that we don't deserve. But God gives them to us as an act of his grace, his mercy, his love, so that we can have an abundant life. And so if you open up with me in your Bibles to, again, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we're going to be looking at uh, those verses. I know that you're probably tired of seeing them, but I'm hoping that by the time this series is ended, they will be drilled into your mind Amen. the example of the Macedonians. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed of the churches of Macedonia, that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy... And their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, See that you abound in this grace also. This week we're going to be looking again at negative but positive principles as it relates to grace giving. Grace giving should never be neglected because of adverse circumstances. As we've seen, as we just read, the Macedonians were in the midst of adverse circumstances. Uh, they were being persecuted. They were having their stuff uh, taken away. They were being uh, having their lands taken away. They were uh, didn't have a whole lot to give. They were in the midst of affliction, tribulation. But they did not allow their negative circumstances to keep them from giving, from serving others. The negative principle is obvious. It is human nature to use any excuse that we're given to not give. Amen. Any excuse that we can find to not serve. Any excuse that we can find to not manage our time. Amen. Uh, it is human nature to excuse ourselves. Mm -hmm. To justify ourselves. I had a band teacher. His favorite thing was to say, if you need an excuse, you got one. I hated that when I was a teenager. 
I hated him when he said that. I have I have grown to appreciate it the more I've matured, the older I've gotten. If you need an excuse, if I need an excuse, you've got one. The point is, is you shouldn't need an excuse. I shouldn't need an excuse. But we love to make excuses. Ah, uh, uh, I'm annoyed with that person. I'm not going to serve them. Oh, the pastor, uh, you know, he's, he's not doing what I want him to do. So, you know, I'm just not going to show up for that activity. <laughs> or, uh, you know, I don't like the person who's running that ministry. Our personalities don't necessarily uh, connect. So I'm not going to support that ministry. Come on now. Mm -hmm. And we make excuses not to serve God or not to serve him 100%. Right. Oh, I'm going to prove a point. They need me. I'm not appreciating. Uh oh. Yeah. Come on. I know. Pastor Curtis is here. Comes another one. But my job is to challenge you and to challenge me with what the Bible says. And the Bible says in the midst of affliction, we are to give. In the midst of pain and suffering, you and I are to keep not just giving of our financial resources, which is important. You and I should give and honor God with our physical resources. If you are not, you need to pray and seek God and ask why. Is it because you don't have or because you're being rebellious, right? But also, it's a case of serving God. If you and I are making excuses not to serve, making excuses not to be involved, making excuses to not give 100%, you're not hurting me, you're not hurting the church, you're worried with God. That's right. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <clears throat> Right? If I, if I decide that I'm not going to do what God wants me to do or do it 100%, I'm not at war with you. I'm at war with God. Because ultimately it's I, I who will stand before God. I'm not going to stand before you and you're not going to stand before me. You're going to stand before God. I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to answer for what I did. My attitudes, my selfishness, my self-centeredness. Come on. Right. What did I do half-heartedly? Burned away. What did I do to prove a point? Burned away. Oh, I'm going to show him they need me. Burned away. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Amen. We are not to make excuses when it comes to serving God, when it comes to being stewards. Amen. We live our lives putting what we believe must be done in front of what God wants us to do. Amen. Making excuses. Well, my kids want to be involved in this. So I'm going to make sure they can do that. Come on. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, when I was a kid, uh, we didn't use sports or school as an opportunity not to go to church. We had a job to do. Uh, when we came home, we did our homework so that we could go to church on Wednesday nights. Yeah. And on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights. That was a priority. You came home and you did your work. You didn't put it off right. to the last minute so you could say, I'm not going to church. Yeah. Come on. Sports did not take the place of coming and being in God's help house and serving God. I can't tell you the number of things I missed because I needed to serve in the house of God, volunteer to make sure people were ministered to. But we don't want to sacrifice. We don't want to hurt ourselves. We don't want to extend ourselves beyond the minimum. And let me tell you, what we're asking for is beyond the minimum. What God wants is beyond the minimum. Amen. What God wants for us is beyond the minimum. He wants 100% plus. Yeah. He wants all of us. Yeah. He wants us, our time, our talents, our abilities, our resources, our families. He wants everything. Amen. And he doesn't like it when we ex make excuses not to give it to him. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when we make excuses not to make him the priority. It must break God's heart when someone has a calling and a gift and because of anger or rebelliousness they refuse to operate in it or refuse to give 100%. Amen. Amen. It must break his heart when someone is talented and gifted but they are using rebelliousness or using slight or circumstances to not walk in that. We are to give what God has purposed us to give. We are to serve the way that God has given us to serve and not make excuses. That's a positive principle that living grace motivates us as believers to rise above circumstances and realize the seriousness of an obligation to give. Amen. Living grace
grace gives you and I the strength to rise, to transcend circumstances. I, I, I'm going to be open with you. I'm open. When someone hurts me, it's hard for me to recover. When someone says an idle word that hurts, it's hard to recover. But God's living grace elevates us. Amen. So that we don't allow those things to hinder our stewardship. Amen. That's what His grace is there for. But I like to be mad. I like to be angry. I'm justified in my righteous anger. Come on. I'm justified in my bad attitude. I'm justified for not giving 100%. God, it hurts his heart and the devil laughs. Because he knows as long as we're acting that way, we're not accomplishing the purpose that he has set before us. Amen. We can allow grace. God will give us the grace. To elevate us, to help us transcend our affliction, our circumstances, those that have hurt us to still accomplish, to still give what God has given us to give. Amen. Give, give, give. No one is putting a, a, a dollar sign. No one is putting an amount on your time. I've never done that and I will never do that. But we all need to give something. Mm -hmm. Grace giving is sharing with others. Human nature tempts you and I to believe, uh, uh, tempts the believer to keep his abundance to satisfy his own selfishness. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus tells a story in Luke chapter 12 that has always just slapped me across the face whenever I've read it. And I've read it uh, uh, multiple times. Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. I will not read it for you, but I will summarize it for you. There's a, a man... And the rich man in the ground was just over fertile that year and producing crops like crazy, more than it had ever produced. God was blessing him more than he could ever possibly imagine. One night, as he's looking uh, and he's dreaming, he says to himself, I will pull down my current barns and I will expand them to be able to fill it with all this abundance. And God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be by which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. We're like that man and don't even recognize him. Amen. We are selfish, self-centered people by nature. It is the curse of Adam and Eve. Human nature makes us selfish and self-centered in our lives. We're like this man where God blesses us beyond measure, but we still use it only to satisfy ourselves. Amen. And I, I can be honest with you. Uh, when I first started out, I would say, God, if you would just give me a raise to this, I'd give more. And God would give me that raise, and uh, I would have it gone like that. Come on. Uh, and I say, God, oh, if you'll just raise me to this level, uh, I'll give more. And God would give me the raise in his mercy and grace, and I'd spend it just like that. That's no different than this man. When God blesses you with abundance, with a blessing, he doesn't do it for your own benefit. He does it for us to bless others. Amen. We're not supposed to build bigger barns. Uh, we're not supposed to get the bigger house. We're not supposed to get the nicer car. We're not supposed to do all of those things and neglect taking care of the widow, taking care of the orphan, right. serving him. That's right. No one is against wealth, and we're going to talk about that more in a moment. Wealth in and of itself is not sin. Putting it in front of God is. That's the right. love of money is the root of all evil. That's right. Money is not. Wealth is not. Possession, possessions are not. Uh, your talents are not. Your gifts are not. But they can become a stumbling block when I'm more in love with those things than I am with God. Oh, right? And so they affect our lives. And so we can't be like the rich man where we hoard it all to ourselves. And don't share it with others. And James, man, he doesn't mess around in James chapter 5. He tells us what that sort of selfishness will do to us. He says, come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. 
Your gold and silver are corroded, and your corrosion will be a witness against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on your pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have uh, condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. That's the ultimate destiny of those who allow money, riches, and pride in themselves and their own success to uh, consume them. What you take pride in, what I take pride in above God, will eventually be destroyed. While you and I feel less with that we don't share with others, it will become corroded. And it will ultimately destroy us. Jesus. That, that, that's the key. When I become so self-absorbed that I'm not <laughs> serving God 100%. Oh, I'm so talented. Oh my goodness, I'm so talented, I'm so gifted, uh, they're lucky I do what I do. Oh boy. It will destroy you and eat you alive on the inside. Oh boy. Come on. Right, I'm so, uh, uh, I'm so uh, blessed beyond measure, they're lucky that I give my 10% to them. Come on. We have that attitude. Uh, I've had that attitude before. I'm not perfect. You know, I allow pride and arrogance to seep in every once in a while where I think that I'm more than what I am, where I think I'm special uh, in the sight of man instead of worrying about what I look like in the sight of God. We all allow selfishness and pride to do that to us. Amen. But if we allow it to go unchecked, it will destroy Amen. us. And it will destroy the purpose that God has given to us. But grace, living grace, it motivates you and I as believers to let God use His abundance to meet the needs of others. Amen. He, it allows you and I to take what God has blessed us with and to share it with others. 2 Corinthians 8, 12 says, For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. Mm -hmm. It is the attitude of the heart and not the amount of the offering or the amount of the gift or the serving. Because I could be here uh, 80 hours a week. If I'm doing it with the wrong attitude out of resentment, it means nothing. Right? right? Yeah. Uh, or I could give uh, tons of money. But if I'm doing it with the wrong attitude, it means nothing. But if I'm here and giving from my lack, that means something to God. Amen. If I'm sacrificing my time to be in God's house, to be in God's presence, and giving it with an attitude of worship and an attitude of love, uh, th that means something to God. It's all in the heart. It's all in the mind. God doesn't care about an amount. He cares about the heart. He cares about the condition of our mind, the condition of our heart. Why do we do what we do? Are we filled with integrity or not? God wants us to be men and women of integrity. Who, everything that we do is not done with ulterior motives. It's done from a pure heart because of our love for God and as a result, our love for others. Amen. God wants us to give. And worship and honor and praise Amen. to Him. And His living grace, His living grace is that motivator to us to give our abundance to bless the lives of others. Amen. Amen. And here's the thing. An unfair burden should not exist on those who have been blessed with abundance while those who may not be blessed as much, decide they're just going to let those folks take the load. Amen. That's not how it's supposed to work either. God blesses people and abundance is not sin, as we said earlier. And we have a, an attitude in our society today that if I have less than someone else, they should be paying for me. Mm -hmm. That's the attitude. 
that person gives, and they should give out of a heart and love and give what God lays upon their heart. Let them give and give and give. That is not an excuse for me not to give. Amen. Right? Amen. Right? God requires them to give, but he also requires us to give. Yeah. He requires us to serve. Listen, uh, I can't sing. Right? I'll never be on a stage. I'll never be a performer. Uh, I, I will <clears throat> never be that person that people want to hear sing because I can't sing. Right? As my daddy used to say, I couldn't carry a tune in the bucket. But I will tell you what I can do. I can make a joyful noise. Right? Amen. Amen. All right. Right? Yep. And that's what I do. Noise and screeching and hollering. But I do it because I've given what I got. Amen. Right? And there's someone else, Pastor Matt, he sings beautifully. Just because he can sing beautifully doesn't mean I'm not supposed to sing. Right. Just because he worshiped doesn't mean I'm not supposed to worship. Right. He don't pick up your slack. Right, that's good. Right, right. Uh, he don't pick up just because he sings like a nightingale. God doesn't mean I'm cut of responsibility of worshiping God. Wow. Come on. Just because someone may be more gifted or more blessed than what you think that you are does not uh, take away your responsibility to serve God, to love God, to give God everything that you have. Amen. The Corinthians were wealthy people. I told you that earlier. They were wealthy. A wealthy people. And Paul told them that it was not fair for them to pick up all the slack and give it to Jerusalem while the Macedonians gave nothing. Come on, he says that in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 13 through 15. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened. Right? For others to be eased and you burden. He expected everyone to give what God purposed in their heart. Now that person may give a hundred dollars and that person a dollar. But in the sight of God, it all is worthy. And, and he takes worship from it. That person may stack chairs and another person can preach like crazy. And God's sight, uh, they're both equally important in acts of service to him. Ah, if we would get into our mind that what God has given us is in no less in His sight than what He gave somebody else, or is no greater in His sight than what He's given somebody else, the church would change. Amen. Amen. Wow. The attitudes would change. Wow. People would serve no matter what. People would give no matter what. Because we stop looking at others and we start looking at God. Wow. <laughs> person does next to you and worry about what you're doing. Amen. Sometimes we just focus too much on what the other person's doing. Amen. And it cripples us from doing what God has for us to do. I heard a story once and actually I remember it happening. My churches where my grandmother grew up is that there were people that had metal offering plates. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. uh, metal. Mm -hmm. And they would deliberately use coins to drop in there so you could hear it when they put their money in. Paper didn't make enough noise. Right? Now, what's scary is that attitude probably came from worrying that someone was judging them. Because they weren't giving. Uh, they're watching me. Sister so-and-so in the second row is making sure that Brother Bob in the fourth row is giving something. <laughs> Come on. And so, in an act of rebelliousness, they would go get their offering and change and drop it in so it made lots of noise. And now you know Brother Bob on the fourth row is giving something so Sister So-and-So can keep her mouth shut. Wow. But that is the wrong attitude. That is pride on the part of Brother Bob. <laughs> Arrogance. Not giving with a proper attitude. 
stop looking at others. I got to stop looking at others on what they're doing and what they're giving and focus on what God's given me to do. Amen. And if we'll do that, this church will never want for money. This church will never want for service. This Amen. church will never want for another volunteer. Amen. Amen. Uh, that is just the fact of what it is. We have enough members that we should never have an event that people aren't there to serve. Amen. We have enough members that this church should be able to pay its bills every month on time. Amen. That is a fact. There's no reason. And that is a challenge to me and that is a challenge to you. Don't get mad at the pastor for saying, get mad at Paul writing in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. <laughs> I'm just saying what God says. Amen. <laughs> All right. The next one. And this is on the church. Grace giving is sensible administration. When you give, what you give should be administered properly. Well, I can tell you that I don't take the salary. Pastor Matt takes nothing. No one in this church is paid. We are all volunteers. Every hour given is a volunteer hour. Every minute given, every time my phone rings, that's volunteer. The money in this church goes to pay the bills and to do ministry. 100% of it. All the money brought in from the kids, it goes right back out the door and it goes to buy ducks and sheep and water, the whole kit and caboodle. That is a fact. Right? Uh, the change you collect, it goes out to do ministry. Okay? Uh, we don't misuse the money. And it's the church's responsibility to make sure it is not misused. The church's account is not the pastor's piggy bank. It's no one's piggy bank. It is there to minister and serve. Now someday, 50 years down the road, maybe I'll be able to quit my job and go full time. Who knows if I'm still kicking. But the truth of the matter is, so I'm not saying it's wrong to pay. I'm not saying it's wrong for the church to support those who are, uh, who are ministering. But it needs to be done sensibly and not to the detriment of the church. Right. Amen. Amen. So uh, we got to make sure that that money, when it is given, that there are no worries of what it's being spent on. But I can assure you that everything that's done is done through a heart of worship, a heart of prayer, and through prayerful consideration, or it must be done. Mm -hmm. Things that have to be done in life of the church. Keep the lights on. Keep the gas on. Pay the rent. Pay the loan. Pay, all the, pay the bills. Mm -hmm. Right? And that is key to stewardship so that you know what you are giving is being used properly. Right. And when you and I don't believe what we're giving is used properly, we'll stop giving. That's right. And it's not just money, it's also serving. When I believe that when I'm going to an event and volunteering and serving, it's, not, it's, it's futile, it doesn't mean anything, no ministry is happening, you're going to stop volunteering. Mm -hmm. Right? The sensible administration of what you give is a requirement on the church to meet. To ensure that anyone who serves that body knows that what they're doing is being used for the cause of Christ. Right? Uh, and that is on the verdict, is on the church. And Paul tells them, look, uh, he says, uh, I've put Titus uh, to go and he's trustworthy to administer the fund. You don't have to worry that he's going to use that money before it gets to Jerusalem. I'm sending these other trustworthy folks, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 22 and 23. They're going with Titus. They're trustworthy guys. They're not going to be pilfering out of the pot that you've given before it can make it to Jerusalem. Right? They are good people that I uh, have put all uh, trust in to make sure that your gift is not uh, wasted or used or fraudulently wasted. Right? To make sure that it is administered properly. Pastors have a responsibility to administer the finances and the talents and the gifts of their people properly. Amen. And then next, grace giving motivates others. The negative principle is that human nature discourages giving in others because in, uh, its negative giving attitudes are contagious. Bad attitudes... They're like a bad case of the flu. Uh, just going up and talking to somebody and shaking their hand, if you haven't washed your hands, you're going to give them the flu. Come on. You're, you are. If I got a bad attitude, just walking 
coming up to you and sharing what I'm all upset about is going to be enough to cause you to start thinking, hmm. Or if I'm sitting in church not worshiping, uh, you know, I'm sitting in church looking angry all the time, people are going to get a water. Hmm. Come on, it's human nature. Yeah. Uh, someone comes to you and all you do is gossip about what's wrong and not talk about what's right. Uh, you're going to spread bad attitude. Amen. Like the flu. It will spread everywhere. But on the contrary to that. If you and I have good attitudes, if we're a little bit of light and a lot of darkness, and we start to share that good attitude, the happiness to give, the joy of giving, the joy of serving, right? If we take the things that give any places on us, resentment, anger, bitterness, and we give them to God and we serve God joy uh, joyfully, yes. we're cheerful givers, it is contagious as well. Yes. Smile on my face. Serving God, not expecting anything in return, should motivate those around us to smile on their face and give without an expectation of return. Which are you and which am I? Am I smiling, saying, let's do this together? Or are we angry, making everybody else around us angry? Amen. That's the question to ask ourselves. We're going to be contagious either way. Are we being contagious in spreading the flu? Or are we being contagious in giving the vaccine? That's the key. Which am I going to do? Which are you going to do? Good attitude, bad attitude. Either way, you can impact those around you, but you have to choose which one you're going to be. And that means sometimes, uh, that means putting aside your feelings for someone else, or your attitude towards somebody else. It means putting aside maybe a, a word said idly. Come on. It means putting aside our own uh, uh, you know, uh, attitudes. And it means putting those things aside. I'm not asking you to be fake. I'm asking you to reflect the internal reality that's on the inside. Amen. See, what you are is you're supposed to be the light of the world. I'm supposed to be the light of the world reflecting Christ. Uh, I'm not supposed to be angry, bitter, mad, resentful all the time. Amen. That should be uh, an exception, not the rule. And when I feel those things, I need to repent and say, God, help me. Get them out of my life. Let me tell you, uh, on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, this brother's got to say, God, forgive me for my resentful attitude this week. Come on. Because wherever there's people in church or on your job, you are going to get resentful based on what you do compared to what they do. Amen. Based on your attitude towards them or their attitude towards you. Amen. Based on the way you think they should have did something and the way you would have done something. Oh my goodness, gracious mercy me. It causes bad attitudes. Mm -hmm. And it's contagious and it, and, and it will destroy a church. It will destroy a church. But on the other hand, if I'm the light of the world and I'm serving God joyfully with a smile on my face, I'm faithful, I'm loyal, uh, those things are contagious and it can grow a church. When you leave this place, you can't wait to tell somebody else about what God is doing. You can't wait to tell somebody else about what you, you know, you may look around and say, well, you know, in the physical and the natural, there's seats empty and there's only about 30 or 35 people there. But in the spiritual, I can see where it's going. Amen. I can see right. people saved. I can yeah. see lives Amen. changed. I can see the hungry fed. I can see right. the sick making clothes. I can see the sick healed. I can see the depressed uplifted. I can see the oppressed set free. Come on, you got to see those things in the spiritual realm Amen. so that you Take them out into the physical realm and walk with those things. And when I do it, I'll encourage my brother to do it. And when you do it, you'll encourage your brother or sister to do it. Amen. Stop waiting for somebody else to do something. Be the change that you want to see. Amen. That's not my quote. I don't know whose quote that was, but I'm sure you heard it from somewhere. Be. What you want others to be. And you'll let them and encourage them to be that too. Mm -hmm. Don't lower yourself to the standard of others, but raise the standard. Amen. Let Amen. me raise the standard yes, through my love and my joy and my positive attitude. Loving others in spite of 
Yes. Serving others in spite of. Raise the bar, don't lower it. That's right. When you have pole vaulters, they don't start with the bar real high and then lower it as you go. They start low and they raise it as you go because they're weeding out those who, oh my goodness gracious, they're weeding out those who just are uh, pretenders and those who are real competitors. Wow. They raise the bar because as you raise the bar, those who have worked hard, those who have put in the time training, those who have put in the effort training, those who are trying to be the best that they can be, they're the ones that are going to keep going up and over. No matter how high you raise it, to put in the effort, have a good attitude, raise the bar for the, those around you. And then when they, even if they are fast enough as you think they should be fast, just keep raising the bar. You may inch them slower, up, 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 but eventually you will raise them up. Amen. Grace giving should be satisfying to all who are involved. Human nature so sparingly with a grudging heart or a necessity, and therefore they reap sparingly. The Bible is clear, you reap what you sow. Right? No questions about it. There is a law, it is in nature, and it is a spiritual principle. What you sow is what you reap. If you sow anger, you'll reap anger. If you sow discord, you'll reap discord. If you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. But if you sow happiness, you'll reap happiness. If you sow joy, we'll reap, uh, uh, reap joy. If we sh uh, show love, uh, sow love, we'll reap love. You will reap what you sow. I can't plant corn and expect to get green beans. I can't Amen. plant cucumbers and expect watermelons. I got to <laughs> sow what I want to reap. And if I want to reap love, I got to sow love. If I want to reap, uh, if I, if I want to reap uh, peace, I got to sow peace. If I want to reap friendship, I got to be a friend. I got to sow yes. friendship. If I want to reap uh, these things, I got to sow them. And then when I don't sow, I get mad at somebody. I ain't sowed nothing, but I expect to reap something. But when I sow nothing, the only thing I'm going to reap is nothing. <laughs> no one's planted your garden for you. No one's planted my garden for me. My dad used to tell her, and uh, I knew that he was going to come out after doing his garden and plant the seeds. He didn't wait for some Samaritan to come by and throw some seeds and plant his garden for him. He got out there and he said, I want cucumbers. I'm sowing cucumbers there. And I want corn. I'm putting the corn there and watermelons go there. He sowed the seed that he expected to reap. And when it came time for harvest, he reaped that which he sowed. So what you want to reap, and you will reap it. Amen. And you will reap what you sow. There's a story in the Bible, and God was going to deliver one of the Israelite kings from the enemy. And it was either Elijah or Elisha. I can't remember which one. But he told the man to take an arrow and shoot it. You guys remember what I'm talking about? And depending on how many shot would depend on his victory over them. And I can't remember, he shot like three times. Mm -hmm. and, and the prophet says, uh, dude, you shortchanged yourself. Because you only shot three times, uh, you're going to subdue them, but you're not going to destroy them. What you should have done is emptied your quiver. Mm -hmm. Right? You should have emptied your quiver. If you'd have emptied your quiver, then you would have utterly been destroyed before. You see, some of us, we don't empty our quiver. Amen. We're satisfied with sowing a little and reaping a little. And we ain't going to sow and put in the time so that we can reap a lot. Wow. We don't have the trust and the faith in God. Or we just don't have the time. We don't have what we want to give to sow a lot. We'll sow our little patch. Yeah. And then we reap a little patch. But then someone else sows a garden and they reap a garden. We're like, wait, what just happened there? Yeah. Why are they more blessed than I'm blessed? Why is God using them more than they're using me? Well, they sold a garden, and you sold a, a plot. <laughs> right? You reap what you sow, I reap what I sow. Don't get mad that you're not reaping if you're not sowing. Amen. It ain't the pastor's fault. Amen. It ain't your parents' fault, it ain't your teacher's fault, it ain't nobody's fault but your fault and my fault if I ain't reaping because I'm not sowing. That's good. 
I don't dig your garden and I don't plant your seeds. If you don't dig my garden, you don't plant my seeds. That's good. I dig the garden, I plant the seeds, and God gives the increase. Amen. Pastor doesn't give the increase. That's right. You don't give the increase. Mm -hmm. God gives the increase. Yes. And you and I, we will sow abundantly. And we will sow what we wish to reap. You will be amazed. I will be amazed at what God will do. Amen. And finally, grace giving will always be sufficient for all needs. Human nature sows sparingly and the result is unfulfilled needs. But grace giving is sufficient to meet the needs of ministry. Financial and serving all of it. Using our talents because it is all, look, Pastor Matt has said this uh, uh, many times. My wife has said it. It's in the house. Yeah. Everything that this church needs to be what God wants us to be is here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Talent, gifts, abilities. Right? It's all here. The ingredients are here. Yeah. Right? It's all here. It's in the house. But when you and I are not doing what God wants us to do, we're not giving, we're not serving, we, we got bad attitudes of resentment, those ingredients are not being put to use the way they're supposed to be put to use. And guess what? You, you don't get the result. Amen. If I try to make vegetable soup without vegetables, guess what? It's not vegetable soup. If I try to make chicken noodle soup without noodles, it ain't chicken noodle soup. If the chicken decides I'm going to sit in the, cow on the, in the refrigerator and not get in the pot, guess what? It's not chicken soup. If the carrots and the, and, and the corn decide I'm not going to get in the pot, guess what? It ain't vegetable soup. Come on. I can't choose to be involved when, because I or to choose not to be involved and expect the result that God wants to have. We are a body with different gifts and different talents, and God expects all those things to be brought together to make a delicious casserole. Yeah. Right? Yes. yes, I know it's food. <laughs> um, but that's what it's about. Yes. Putting all the pieces together. And if we will put all the pieces together, if you will serve and you will serve and you will serve and you will serve and we will all get up and serve regardless of our circumstances and attitudes and people, the casserole will come together and this church will fulfill the mission and the vision that it has had for the last five and a half years. Amen. Amen. But it will never be that because I can't do it on my own. And you can't do it on, you can't do it on your own. We need everyone to do what God has purposed them to do. And when that happens, when that happens, when that happens, next door becomes a reality instead of a storage building. Oh, goodness gracious. Instead of it holding knickknacks and junk, It'll be used for ministry, but it ain't going to happen to all of us do what we're supposed to do. Amen. Stop sitting on your pew. Stop sitting in your seat and waiting for someone else to do. But get up and do what God has purposed you to do. And when you when do what you're purposed to, she does what she's purposed. And so on and so forth. And it will make a difference. Stop waiting on somebody else to move. But move. Enough to bake one more meal 
for my family. Mm -hmm. Enough oil, enough meal to make one more meal, and then that's it. Mm -hmm. And Elijah said, just do me a favor. Take what you have mm -hmm. and give it to me first. And your oil and your flour will never run dry. Amen. And that lady had a choice to make. Had she been selfish and self-centered and said, I'm going to eat and die, she would have ate her last meal. Her family would have ate their last meal, and you never heard from them again. But because of her obedience to serve God when the opportunity was presented to her to serve the prophet, the man of God, when the opportunity was given to her, she went home, baked him a cake, and then guess what happened? She went home and then baked her family a cake. And then when it got time for breakfast the next morning, well, looky there, she baked another cake. And then when it got time for lunch, she said, well, my goodness gracious, uh, there's another cake's worth. And she went to dinner and she said, hmm, oh, uh, well, it's still full. Let me put it up. See, I don't believe that God just miraculously filled the flour jar up to the top and the oil up to the top. See, I believe there's enough for one cake and one little bit of oil to make it. Uh, and so every time she walked back to that pantry, she took the same amount out of the boat and they were empty. But the next time she went, it was filled up again. And God met the needs of the man of God and her family because they were obedient. Because no matter how much we look like we lack, a little bit in the hand of God will do what it is accomplished and set forth to do. Get your oil. Get your meal. And when you go to dip in again, God will make sure it's there for you to use again. Uh, don't worry. You can't be used up. Amen. Don't worry. You can't give too much. Don't worry. You can't serve too much. Don't worry about that. Because you give and you serve. God will continue to supply all your needs according to His riches and glory. Goodness gracious. Somebody hear what I'm saying to you this morning. Stand up. Thank you for listening to this message. We hope that you enjoyed it and were blessed by it. Each month we have people from all over the world who listen to the messages made available. If you've been blessed by this ministry, would you consider making a donation of any amount to help support us as we continue to reach the loss for Christ? Donations can be made online at www.reviveoc.org or by check at Revive Outreach Church, 411 Chatham Heights Road, Suite 101, Fredericksburg, Virginia, 22405. Thank you for your prayers and your continued support. May God richly bless you.